Hey guys, today we are going to be talking all about the Z transform. Now this video might get a bit intense, uh, there are a lot of tough concepts to crack, so I suggest you go and grab a coffee, sit down and try to relax. Now I have put timestamps down below of the various topics I'm going to be talking about, so hopefully you can refer back to this video and you know jump around them as you wish. Another thing is that before I begin, everything I'm talking about refers to linear time invariant systems, so if you don't know what that is, pause the video, go and google it and then come back here. So without further ado, let's get going. Now if you've clicked on this video, you almost certainly know that most of the data that we handle nowadays is digital. And what I mean by that is that the data is discrete along the time axis. It is sampled data, so instead of having continuous signals like x of t where it's defined for every possible value of time, well, we now have sequences where we have x of k big T, where big T is our sampling interval. So I'm just going to abbreviate this into x sub k. So x sub 0 is just x of 0. x sub 5 is x of 5t and so forth. Now the idea behind the z-transform is that we want to take this tool that we use for continuous signals and systems, the Laplace transform, and convert it into an equivalent tool for discrete signals and systems. And I'm going to show you just how we do that. So let's start off at the Laplace transform right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is replace the small t with a k big T. And that is because our data is sampled. You know, we only have data at discrete values of k. Now, because we're dealing with discrete time, we can change this continuous integral into a discrete summation. So it's going to look something like this. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is make this substitution where I have z equals e to the power of s big T. And the whole purpose behind making this substitution is that I just want to make the algebra nicer. So when I make this substitution, we have this right here. And this is the definition of the z transform. So hopefully now you can see where this z transform comes from. Now let's actually talk about some of the properties, the useful properties of this z transform. Now for this section, I'm really just going to be telling you the properties of the z-transform and not going into the proofs behind them because if I did go into the proofs, well, this video would be very long and very boring. But you can just Google the proofs if you really are interested in where they come from. So anyways, the first property I'm going to be talking about is the linearity of the z-transform. Now the z-transform is linear, just like the Laplace transform from where it comes from. So what that means is for two scalars, alpha and beta, and two sequences, xk and yk, well, the z transform of alpha xk plus beta yk all in brackets is just alpha times the z transform of xk plus beta times the z transform of yk. Now, the second property of the z transform that I'm going to be talking about is how it acts on the time delay operator. So, a time delay of size 1 basically just maps all the entries of a sequence to its previous entry. So, you know, g3 becomes g2, g5 becomes g4 and g sub k becomes g sub k minus 1. Now, the z-transform acts on this in the following way. The z-transform of g k minus 1 is equal to 1 over z, or z inverse, times the z-transform of g. Now, you also have to add on this little term here, which is g little g of minus 1. Now, for causal systems where the output happens as a result of the input, well, this g minus 1 term is just going to be 0. Non-causal systems are a bit confusing because they're systems where the output starts reacting to inputs that haven't even happened yet. So we're not going to be talking about them here. We're just going to be dealing with causal systems and that g minus 1 term is just going to be crossed out into 0. Now, of course, we can extend this into arbitrarily large time delays. So the z transform of g k minus m is going to look something like this. Now, as I mentioned earlier, for causal systems, all these g minus 1, g minus 2, all the way up to g minus m terms are just going to be 0. So we're just left with this, which is z to the minus m times big G, the z transform of g. Now the third property I'm going to be talking about is called the time advance operator. And this is very similar to the time delay operator, except it just maps every entry of a sequence into its future entry. So a time advance of size 1 would map g1 into g2, g3 to g4, and g sub k into g sub k plus 1. And the z transform of a time advance of size 1 looks something like this. And just as before, we can extend this into arbitrarily large time delays. So the z transform of g sub k plus m looks something like this. Now, of course, I have just stated these results without proving them, but the proofs are quite simple. So if you don't quite understand where these are coming from and that frustrates you, well, 
do Google it and you'll find the proofs online. Or if you can't find them, just let me know and I can give them to you. Now, the fourth property I'm going to be talking about is how the Z transform acts on convolution. Now, if you know anything about the Laplace transform and the Fourier transform, well, you should guess that convolution in the time domain is just multiplication in the Z domain. Now, the fifth and the sixth property that I'm going to be talking about are not so much properties, but theorems. And they're called the final value theorem as well as the initial value theorem. So let's start by talking about the final value theorem. The final value theorem basically just lets you find the final value, the settling value of a signal that has passed through a system without calculating the inverse Z transform, which can be a bit tedious. And to use the final value theorem, well, basically you just take the limit as Z tends to one of this right here. Now, one thing you have to note is that this only applies to stable systems because well, if your system isn't stable and it's just going to be oscillating between two values or it's going to shoot off into infinity, well, there is no final value. So let's now talk about the initial value theorem. And as you might guess, the initial value theorem lets you find the initial value of a signal that has passed through a system without going into calculating the inverse Z transform. Now, that initial value is just the limit as you let Z tend to infinity of this. So now that I've listed out some useful properties of the Z transform, let's build up a convolutional representation of systems. But in order to do that, I'm gonna to have to define the unit pulse and the unit pulse response. Now, the beginning of this section is really just a summary of my video on the pulse and impulse response. So I suggest you check that out first if you want a more in-depth explanation of this topic. But anyways, a unit pulse is just defined as a spike of one at time zero and a zero everywhere else. So it's literally just a little spike of input at time zero of size one. Now the pulse response is just the response of a system, the output, when you feed that spike of input into that system. Now as a sequence, the unit pulse looks something like this. It's just a one followed by zero, 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 all the way until infinity. Now if I feed that unit pulse into my system G, well, I'm gonna get some output, which is the pulse response. And that looks like G0, G1, G2, whatever it is. So what happens when I delay that pulse by just a little bit? So instead of one zero 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 zero, I have zero one zero 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 zero. Well, if I feed that into my system G, because these systems are time invariant, as I mentioned before, well, the output is gonna be exactly the same, but shifted a little bit. So it's gonna look like zero G0, G1, G2, all the way until infinity. And of course, if I delay this one step further, the output's gonna be zero, zero, G0, G1, and so forth. Now the goal here is to figure out how can I find out what my output Y sub K is when I feed my system G with some arbitrary input U sub K. So in order to do that, let's represent the input U sub K as a linear combination of pulses. So U sub K looks something like this, you know, it's U zero, U one, all the way until U infinity. Well, that can be written as this, where it's U zero, times a pulse, plus u1 times a delayed pulse, plus u2 times an even more delayed pulse, and so forth. Now, since my system is linear, when I feed the sum of all of these into my system, the output is just going to be u0 times the pulse response, plus u1 times the slightly delayed pulse response, plus u2 times an even more delayed pulse response, and so forth. And this is essentially just discrete convolution. So my output y sub k is just G sub K, the pulse response, convolved with my input U sub K. Now the beauty of the Z transform is I can turn this ugly convolution into multiplication if I work in the Z domain. So the Z transforms of all of these, Y is just the multiplication of G times U. Now I want to end off this video by giving you guys an example. And the example I'm gonna use is how you can use Z transforms to solve difference equations. Now a linear difference equation is just the discrete equivalent of a linear differential equation. And it just says that your output is some function of previous inputs and outputs. And this is an example of a difference equation. Now, because this is a second order difference equation, you know, our highest index is the YK plus two. Well, we need two initial conditions to solve this. So let's just say that Y one is zero and Y zero is one as some arbitrary initial conditions. Now we also need to define the input signal u. And to just keep things simple, I'm gonna say that the input is just a series of ones. It's just one, 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 all the way until infinity. And that is actually called a unit step. So what does the solution of a difference equation look like? 
Well, if I gave you this difference equation and asked you to find out what y sub a million is, well, it would take you forever to work it out because you'd have to iteratively work this through from the initial conditions. But if you had some function that just said y sub k is some function of k, well, it would be much faster. And that's what the solution of a difference equation looks like. It's just an explicit function of y sub k as a function of k. So before we solve this difference equation, I'm just going to say that I do urge you guys to work this out in your own time afterwards because I'm going to be presenting the solution, but I'm not going to be detailing every single algebraic step. But anyways, how do we solve this difference equation? Well, we'd first start by taking z transforms of both sides. So doing that, we'd have something like this. Now that last term, that 1 over 1 minus z inverse, is actually just the z transform of a unit step. Now, with a bit of tedious algebra, we can rearrange this to get all the z's on one side and the y on one side to look something like this. Now, this is actually our solution, but it's not the solution we want because this is still in the z domain. It's not in the time domain. We want our solution written explicitly in the time domain. But the problem is this. This is quite an ugly thing to take the inverse z transform of. We actually need to simplify this by using partial fraction decomposition and break this down into a set of smaller terms. Now, if we do that, we arrive at this. And these are fairly standard looking forms where we can take the Z transforms of this, well, the inverse Z transforms, and arrive eventually at our final result, which looks something like this. Now, again, please don't fret if you didn't understand or follow along with the maths because this was just presented to you at lightning speed, just to show you how you would go about solving a problem like this. I do urge you to pause the video and go and do the maths yourself because you'd understand it a lot better that way. So anyways guys, I hope that this video gave you a fairly solid footing into understanding what the Z-transform is and how you might use it. If you have any questions or comments, please do leave a comment down below and I'll catch you guys next time.